Thank you for checking out this installment of Research Craft. I'm Robert Carl. When I was completing college in the early 2000s, one of my history professors was designing and programming her own research and productivity software. She did say, however, that she used a program called DevonThink for note-taking. Duly impressed, I started using DevonThink myself a couple of years years later, unfortunately after I had already completed general exams for my PhD program, but in time for my dissertation research. I've been a big fan of the software ever since. DevonThink 3, which came out in 2019, brought with it a host of new features. Reading software manuals about these is useful, and I've included one particularly helpful title in the episode description below. However, doing so isn't as valuable as seeing how fellow historians are utilizing DevonThink in their own research practice. In this two-part interview, I speak with a pair of colleagues about how they conducted research in the past and how they're using DevonThink for their second book projects. This is not the first time I've discussed DevonThink in this series. We saw it briefly in our our first episode, and it certainly won't be the last. My guest in the first part of this episode is Sarah Osten, who is an associate professor of history at the University of Vermont. She's author of the 2018 book, The Mexican Revolution's Wake, The Making of a Political System, 1920 to 1929, which appeared in paperback in 2020. All right, well, Sarah, thank you so much for coming on Research Craft. It's really great to see you, and I'm super excited to talk about DevonThink, um, which is a program I've been using for a long time, um, but not, I know I'm not using it as well as I should be using it. Um, uh, so I'm super excited to hear about how you've been using it for your new project. Uh, to get us started, though, maybe you could tell us about how you did research for your first book. So when I was thinking about this conversation, I sort of realized that with my first book, I was coming up with workarounds because I didn't have something like Devon Think. Um, so you know how it is. You put together a huge amount of material. You're trying to cross-reference things from multiple archives. Um, and I didn't have software to do that. I didn't have a good way to make documents findable. And an additional, well, I had two really interesting methodological challenges with the archives that I was working in in Mexico for my first book. One, um, and they're sort of opposite challenges in terms of how you find a document. One is that in the Mexican National Archive, when I did my dissertation research initially, you weren't allowed to photograph anything. So it was Xeroxes. And the way I put well, and anyone in that era put identifying citation information on these mountains of Xeroxes was you had to fill out these little uh, basically bookmarks that you would put in the folio of documents and everyone had to have your name and your research ID and the citation information for the document. Uh, and then they stapled those to the documents. Ideally, that was how it was supposed to work. And there was no other identifying information um, I got so fast at filling these out because you had to do a start and a finish for which pages you wanted. I could do it without even looking at it by the end, get everything on all these little lines. I should have brought one to show you. Um, I have a couple stacks of various generations worth of ones from the Columbian, Columbian National Archive as well from the AGN. Yeah, so that was um, sort of presented its own kind of challenge because when I got home from doing my dissertation research, I had thousands of Xeroxes that I had to then file, right? They had to still be associated with their citation information, but then I had to figure out how to cross-reference paper. So that was one problem. Like, particularly because my book was really about alliances and then the breaking of alliances and relationships and correspondence. I was literally putting different voices in dialogue by connecting different archives and coming up with different ends of the conversation between local and state archives and then the national archive and then personal archives that were in a different place and reconstructing the literal conversations that were happening and sometimes finding the two ends of the correspondence in different archives in order to reconstruct those. Um, and doing that on Xerox is, is really difficult. Um, then I was working in state and local archives in Southeastern Mexico where I was allowed to photograph. So then I had a sort of different body of sources in a totally different format. And then I was working in the Calles archive in Mexico City, which didn't allow copies or photographs. So that was straight transcription. And, it, and they were only open effectively about four or five hours a day at that time. 
So I think my record for, I'm an okay typist, but not the best. Uh, I think my record for words that I was able to transcribe in one day sitting in that archive was about 10,000. Wow. And that was literally me after months of doing this, trying to break the, the 10,000 barrier. <laughs> right. Right. Um, and what I found was the research I did in those archives ended up being really different because I couldn't do the sort of bulk collection in the Kaya's archive, I had to really read the documents first and be mindful, how much do I need this? If it is a five page typed document, I spend half an hour in order to have the whole thing. Right. That's really different than when you're in an archive where you can and you can just photograph everything and figure out if you need it later. Yeah, yeah. So, I had to find a way to make all of these different collections intelligible in one piece, but also how to make um, these different kinds of files searchable and findable. And that was an incredible challenge. It took me from the beginning of my dissertation research to when my book was published, I think it was 14 years. Wow. And yeah, this is a conversation we should have had at some point in the last 14 years. So, um, and then things changed at the National Archive in Mexico and it got a little bit easier because I could start photographing and that happened, I think before my dissertation was done, but after most of my dissertation research sure. was complete. Sure. Um, so it's funny, you know, I just wrote another, a new piece about some of that older research and for the first time in a long time, I was actually going through Xeroxes again. And, and miserable. Yes, yes. <laughs> and then, you know, the other interesting thing I've been working on where I've had to really revisit some of that early work and really think about what I did and retracing my steps and how I wanna do research now to make it easier to retrace my steps if I ever have to do this again, is I'm working on the Spanish translation of my first book and having to find the original Spanish for every quote. I, having been through that myself, it was a nightmarish, nightmarish process. Yeah. Uh, and I am, I am a very diligent. Uh, even the copy editor of my book commented how diligent I was in my citations, but I think the error rate was like 3%. Uh, and in a book with a thousand citations, in some cases, you know, I was off by a couple of pages, but in a few cases, I cited the wrong document uh, yeah. entirely. Um, so it was a real, it was a very humbling and all, it, it very humbling and very, very challenging process. My nightmare has been this folder that I have of Xeroxes that's about this thick, um, which was stuff I didn't refile after I did this the first time writing my book manuscript. I just, yes. I finished and I thought I never have to look at this stuff again, probably. And I just put it in one giant folder and it is labeled Chiapas refile. <laughs> And there are about 500 documents in there. I mean, I still have photographs uh, from the Columbian Presidential Archive that I took my very last week of dissertation research in 2007 that I've never gotten around to categorizing. Yeah. So um, I know that you're very opposed to iPhoto as a system, but iPhoto was actually what I was using um, for the photographs that I had. And um, I came up with a way of sort of creating metadata in iPhoto. Um, and actually one of the reasons I was stuck with iPhoto for a while, uh, because I was sort of thinking about how do I move to a single piece of software where I can consolidate all of these different things, um, is that none of the software that I found that was sort of designed to do this would import my iPhoto metadata. Oh, sure, okay. Yeah, uh, I mean, so, so, so many pieces of this are path dependent. That. Mm -hmm. Sorry, so many pieces of this are path dependent, uh, and yeah. that's and that's one of them. Um, but I think it's so, yeah. Tell us, Tropy, tell us what you did. Tropy was the first piece of software I looked at, and I sort of decided to spend I don't know three or four weeks seeing, just investing the time to see if it was going to save me time. And the problem with Tropy is that I could import the photos from iPhoto, but I lost all of my previous tagging. 
Yeah. Um, and I also found it was a pretty, it was a couple of years ago. So it was kind of an early version of Tropy sure. and it, and large file imports, like more than a couple hundred were crashing it. So I sort of gave up on that and I just continued with iPhoto. Um, so iPhoto does have some tagging abilities, which is part of the reason I was using it. So I could put into the description of the photo, all of the citation information, and that would just stay with that photograph from that point forward. Um, so I was doing that and then I was using, I forget which field in iPhoto, um, again, sort of a descriptor um, to do keywording as well. So the basic process would be um, at the end of the day, coming home from the archive, putting stuff into iPhoto immediately, and then making sure all of the citation information for each photo was immediately associated with that photo. So I, I could never lose track of it. Sure. And iPhoto does have some searchability. And I should be clear, by the way, that I am not advocating using iPhoto. <laughs> this is what I was doing for lack of a, a better way of doing it. Right. Uh, sorry, what year was this, more or less? Hmm. I probably started doing this as soon as the AGN in Mexico started allowing photos, which would have been like 2008. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, one of the problems with iPhoto around that time, and one reason that I came up with an alternative system is you hear these horror stories. Well, two reasons. One, um, lack of transparency as to where the images actually were on your hard drive. It's yeah, that's layers, deep. layers deep. And then also you hear these horror stories about someone whose uh, iPhoto database would get corrupted and they'd lose access to their images. Um, so that's why I was that. not an advocate. That's great. I was, I was lucky to not have that. But so the one of the problems that you have when you're taking a huge number of photos is, I don't know how it is for you when you're in the archive, but I'm just sort of hyper focused and I go down all these rabbit holes, which are good, right? You want the rabbit holes. You wanna be able to explore a little bit. That is the main advantage and joy of being in a physical archive. Right. This, this is what Laura Putnam refers to as side glances, right? And very often the side glance becomes sort of the main focus. Um, and it is the beautiful thing, but it, it, it's, it's so hard to balance that psychic sort of mental load as you're, as you're doing it. There's a real intensity to the just mental work that you do in an archive. Um, I think particularly you're not working in your first language. Yes. Um, that is hard to describe to people who haven't done it. Um, I remember I would come home from the Mexican National Archive and they didn't have a cafe or anything. There was no convenient way to eat. So I would just work straight through to maximize my time there. And I would come home to my apartment and I would eat something and then I would just go to sleep. Yeah. And I remember my roommate at the time, at one point just watched me after having seen this procedure every day and he, he said, what do they do to you? Yeah, yeah. Well, and one of the other components that's really hard if you're photographing is just the repetitive strain of taking, you know, I can take 3000 pictures in a day, but leaning over my tripod, it's going to give me headaches. It's going to make my back hurt. It's going to make my neck hurt. So sort of that co combination of the mental challenge, the mental load, and then also what it's doing to you physically. It's really, it's, it's inhuman in, in a way. Um, so, and you can only sustain sort of that pace of like working six, seven, eight hours in an archive for a week or two at a time. You know, if you've got months, uh, maybe you can be a little more methodical, you can sort of be kinder to yourself. But now that we're arch archival tourists, especially at this stage of our life and our career, it's sort of maximize every minute and I know it's going to physically hurt a lot by by Friday. There was this amazing phase of my research which was really probably the best and most fun research I've ever done where I was working with an uncatalogued collection of personal papers um, and it really was like someone had and I assume this is actually what happened someone had just taken a file drawer and dumped it upside down into a box <laughs> and then given it to the archive and thank God they did because a lot of people would have just thrown it away just this old dusty stuff from this guy that um, isn't really considered important by most people but became the sort of central figure of my dissertation and then my book. Um, but first of all, you learn a lot about the person. He clearly had this habit of um, folding up telegrams really small. So I had all these little squares that were about like yay big. And I had to 
you know, with gloves and a mask, like carefully unfold them and then figure out how do I photograph this document without damaging it. Um, there were also things that were rolled up and had been rolled up for 80 years. Uh, so it was this amazing, and again, you have to, you, you can't really put anything on the document because you have to protect the paper. It was this physicality of research that I think we don't always appreciate where, you know, I had one elbow on one corner and then another elbow and I'm trying to like take a picture at the same time. And it really was like this full body research experience. Yes. Um, just trying to get a clear image of a document sometimes. Yes, yes. All right, um, so can you go ahead and show us, um, share your screen and show us sure. some of how you went about this earlier stage of research? So one system that I came up with, which was very entertaining to the archivists where I was working, was to come up with basically analog metadata. So I ripped up little pieces of paper and had keywords on them and would lay them on the document and then photograph it so that I could not just not, I wasn't just retracing my steps in terms of how do I find this document again, but what was I thinking when I saw this document and why did, why did I copy it and how do I want to file it later? Um, so anything that's really important uh, in this, uh, stage of research gets a little star on a little piece of paper. And sometimes there are little arrows, particular things to literally guide myself back oh, to wow. what I noticed about that document that made it important enough to photograph. Okay. That's great. And then I was also doing, I was also doing keywording. So here's an example. Love it. Um, so this is from the personal papers of Tomas Garrido Canaval, who was the socialist, notorious socialist governor of the state of Tabasco. Um, and you can see that what I was most interested in here, you can see my analog keywording is what was happening inside um, rural Ligas de Resistencia, how the Ligas operated internally and their rules and regulations. Um, so that was the keywording. And you can see um, how I've organized my iPhoto here as well. Mm -hmm. um, so this is all stuff for my book research because I'm not doing, this is for the first book. This isn't how I'm doing my current book, thankfully. Give us a sense, give us a sense of, well, it gets two questions. First, give us a sense yeah. of volume. You know, how many photographs do you think, how many documents are in this iPhoto uh, collection? I'm going to guess somewhere in the neighborhood of somewhere between like eight and 10,000. Okay. And then you did a lot of sort of, this is individually tagged metadata, right? Is there some sort of spreadsheet or other database where you kept track of stuff on the other end and sort of not aggregated it? Not for this stuff. Okay. Um, so this stuff is organized by what chapter in the book it belonged in. Mm -hmm. Um, and what archive it's from. So you can see chapter one on Yucatan. I have things from the um, state archive organized by year. Um, and then for the second chapter, again, um, this was one that was about different states. So it's what state it's about and what archive it's from. Um, and then you can see it goes all the way down like that. Okay. And is there any overlap, you know, between like... And then there's my honeymoon and wedding photos there yeah. at the bottom. Um, is there any overlap between like, you know, AGN 6 and any of the other AGN uh, folders here? Like, so, um, so what happened if you end up citing the same document in multiple chapters? And maybe that wasn't the case in your book. No, that came up a couple times. You know, one of the challenges of the book was that I was trying to write a story about national politics, but based on four states. Sure. Um, I don't know that I would do it that way if I wrote this book again. I'm glad with how, I'm, I'm happy with how it came out, but it made it very, very labor intensive because it required really immersing myself in the history of each of those states and then figuring out how all those pieces fit together, not just with the states amongst each other, but then also 
with the national story I was trying to tell. Sure. So they're definitely, one of the challenges of writing the book was avoiding redundancy. Okay. And how do I make it a chronological narrative that also has all these multiple strands without jumping back and forth in time as I'm going from state to state. Um, so there definitely were challenges like that. And I think really the way I dealt with redundancy was once all the pieces were together, going through the whole manuscript and realizing, well, I cited the same document twice in different contexts. How do I account for that in the book? Do I want to keep it? Um, but yeah, that was, the, that was the only way I sort of dealt with that issue. Okay. okay. Yeah, my, like my concern, if I saw this, this organization, obviously this was for your first book, um, yeah. I would worry about sort of, taking you know one archive stuff and breaking it into separate albums or folders like this rather than coming you know having it all in one place centrally organized and having some sort of secondary layer um in between yeah i mean the advantage of doing it this way is that it made it easier to retrace my steps for citation yes yes no uh, i let, yeah. me, let me see if this works if you bring up the information okay so you can see there's additional metadata here right you can see i have the citation information, um, and then I have my keywording down here. Okay, gotcha. Uh, because that made things more findable in iPhoto. Mm -hmm. So the first sort of process was to put citation information on every document. And then the second was to go through and really read the documents and do the keywording. Gotcha. And so if I was writing a section on rural ligas de resistencia, I could do, in Tabasco, I could find this document by searching for Tabasco and rural. Yeah. I love seeing the Canon PowerShot uh, metadata tag there, the venerable, venerable camera. My dad just you know, visited and gave my kids uh, his old one, the same model, not quite as nice as the 800. Shout out to that camera, which I purchased to do my dissertation research. I think I purchased the camera in 2006 and it only just stopped working. So that is the camera I've been using this whole time. It's very small. It's very portable. I didn't really care if it got lost or stolen or broken, um, except then I let my five-year-old play with it. And now the autofocus doesn't work anymore. I still have mine. So, it still works. I'm about to give it to my kids, though, so that'll be the end of it. So we can talk about what I am replacing it with in the sure. sort of second part of our conversation, because I just had to make this decision and okay. sort of decide. I mean, it's one of those things where if it's not broken, don't fix it. There was no reason for me to upgrade. I would go right. into the archive and everybody would have these much fancier, newer cameras, and they were using iPhones and iPads. And I had a system that worked. Yes. And it was very reliable and I didn't find that I needed a higher resolution than that camera could handle for my purposes. Um, and it was great. Yep. Well, I feel the same. I feel the exact same way. Um, there are circumstances where now where I do use an iPhone for lighting reasons, particularly for taking pictures of say an old, the screen of an old microfilm reader. Uh, oh, the, wow. yeah. um, and I found that that's much better than the digital SR. SLR that I normally use for uh, taking pictures in archives, but I have my I have my equipment. I feel comfortable with the setup, so it, you know it's great to hear that that's also the case for you. It's reassuring to hear that's also been the case for you. You know, I briefly used a tripod and then I stopped, um, in part because of the physical spaces that I was yeah. in, um, in part because I didn't want to carry it around. Um, I try to have a pretty small bag with me. Um, just for comfort, just being on the subway, yeah. whatever. Um, but I also just found, you know, when I'm in the Mexican National Archive, which is where I do most of my work right now, um, when I can be there, um, it has a lot of skylights. So there are a lot of shadow issues. Um, I, I think I've said this before on this series, but I can still, almost 15 years later, I can tell you what time of day I took a picture from the Colombian AGN based on the shadows, because there were a lot of skylights, you know, particularly around midday, there's a certain glow. Late in the afternoon, the giant plate glass window behind me cast a very specific light. So I'm familiar, familiar with that challenge. I definitely have documents where across the whole thing, you can see the shadow of my arm holding a camera. Yep. Um, but I try to avoid that. And so I found that the tripod actually sort of got in the way because I was 
literally moving my body around the table and around the document. Um, even just as clouds shifted, never mind yep. time of day. So, um, yeah, as you say, it's another reason that this work is even physically taxing. It was great to hear about how you went about the research for the first project. So, you know, maybe tell us very quickly about the second book uh, and any other projects you're working on, and then we'll dive into how you're using Devon Think to make this happen. Um, so my second book is a big jump for me. It's certainly a big historiographical change for me. Uh, I've really been focused on basically the 19 teens through the 1930s and all of my previous work. And my new project is really about the 1970s and early 1980s. I'm looking at uh, Mexican solidarity with Central American revolutions. And so I just got through saying you shouldn't write a book comparing four different places. And that's not exactly <laughs> what I'm doing, except now instead of four states, I have four countries uh, because I'm looking at Mexican solidarity with revolutions in Guatemala, El Salvador, and Nicaragua. And the idea, the thing I'm most interested in is what did revolution mean in Mexico in that period? Uh, what did it mean to politicians who were uh, pursuing particular diplomatic agendas because they needed to revindicate the ruling party's revolutionary credibility in some cases? What did it mean to solidarity activists who were starting to develop a really increasingly coherent counter narrative about what revolution meant? Um, and why did the Nicaraguan revolution in particular resonate as powerfully as it did in Mexico, not just with dissidents and leftists and solidarity activists, but also with diplomats and even with the president himself in those years. It's an um, awesome, awesome, pro awesome project, awesome second book project. Thank you. Um, and, and part of the reason this was supposed to be a third project, but I really wanted to be able to do oral history um, and I didn't want to put it off another 15 or 20 years. Right. Right. Yeah. I'm really regretting now that I didn't follow up on some contacts that I made when I was in Bogota three, three years ago, you know, particularly yeah. now, particularly now with COVID, I, I have no idea how many of those folks that I met, um, won't be, you know, are already, are already gone. Yeah. Um, and then, you know, I'm glad you brought up COVID because this was the other, um, thing that I've had to deal with in doing, I was on sabbatical this year in doing research for this book. Um, I was lucky in that I did a lot of research already in the Mexican National Archive with the secret police uh, collections that are available there tracking solidarity activism and activists. Um, and I also was able to do some research in the Mexican Foreign Relations Archive looking at the sort of diplomatic side of this question. Um, but what you're seeing here in Devon Think is this massive collection um, that's called CAMENA, I'm forgetting what the acronym stands for, but it's a collection of, um, well, as you can see, numerous collections that are really directly related with the project. Um, a lot of journalism, but then personal papers collections from activists of different kinds that have all been um, collected and totally digitalized and at uh, a university archive in Mexico City, which Great. has been an amazing resource, particularly when I can't be in Mexico. Right. Um, so this is a case where I really, using Devon Think, I have been able to unite disparate collections because I have all these photographs from um, the SRE and from the AGN that I did in the early- Sorry, SRE is, is for the foreign relations. Foreign relations, sorry. Yep. Um, that I did you know, a couple years ago when I was doing the very initial stages of this work. And I'm able to now cross-reference it through Devon Think with these documents that I've been able to download from the Kamena archive. Um, and it, it's really no exaggeration to say that this software has completely changed how I do my research. I downloaded the free version. I was going to use it for a week or two, like I said, to sort of trial run it and see if it was actually going to be useful. And I think within about two days, I was ready to buy the software license. I was sold. Um, and like you said, I am very sure that I am not maximizing all of the things that Devin Think can do. But just the limited way in which I'm using it 
um, has really been transformative to my work. Awesome. Well, walk us through it. If you would, I'm dying to see, you know, if you click on one of these folders, what we're going to find inside. Sure. Um, so one of the really interesting sort of research rabbit holes I've fallen down doing this project um, is the um, the gay liberation movement was really involved in solidarity work um, in Mexico. So the radical gay left in Mexico um, was going to all of these solidarity with Nicaragua events. Um, so that's, it's gonna end up being a whole chapter, I think of my book. Um, so you can see that the way I've organized this is from the Camena collection where it originated. Um, so I've kept that archival logic in my own organizing of documents. As, as then, you should, as you should. Yeah. And then I am still doing, you can see down here um, that I'm doing some of my own keywording, but then that is on top of, of course, the word searchability using the optical character recognition feature in right. Devon Think. Right. And this is, do you have the pro version of Devon Think or is yeah. this the, okay. Yeah. This is one big benefit to the pro version is that it has Abby Fine Reader uh, embedded, the, just one of the top commercial OCR softwares embedded in it. Um, and I, I have, purchased Abby separately, mm -hmm. um, particularly for teaching purposes. Um, but for research purposes, I mean, Devin, Devin Think Pro is worth getting just for this OCR functionality. Yeah, I had also downloaded Abby or purchased it separately and definitely used it, but it doesn't have the databasing feature and to have both integrated. I mean, I think that's really the genius of Devin Think. And I think it's only available for Mac still. I'm not sure if there's yes. a TV version. Yeah, it is so available for Mac. I'm going to show you the same thing that I did with the iPhoto, except I need to get the zoom window out of the way to do this. Um, so you can see the kind of data that I'm collecting for each document. Great. Um, and the nice thing about this um, is that it auto imports the URL from where the original document can be found. So, sorry, how did you get then these JPEGs into Devon Think? Um, so I just did a mass download onto my hard drive and okay. then did an import. Okay. But I, so the way I keep it organized is you can see um, each file. So if we just go to this one, includes a Word document uh, where I kept the original citation information from the archive. Okay. Okay. So this is just cut and pasted from the citation information with that folder in that archive. Okay. So, so I mean, one question I, I have here is, well, Devin think might be good enough um, that that URL that's, you know, the embedded metadata in the JPEG probably depends a little bit on the website that you're downloading the JPEG yeah. from. Um, I didn't do that. Right. That that was included as metadata with the photo. Right, right. Um, and if you could do me a favor and just um, right control click on one of the, the images uh, and we can find out where it lives on your hard drive. Uh... Where are we going? Show in Finder, uh, the fourth, fourth okay. set. Yep. Okay. Just want to know where it lives. Oh, you're not. Look you're not sharing. You, we can't well, see. We can't see that window. Oh, okay. Um. So I have a folder um that is like archival documents, and then I have the archive, and then I have the collection, okay. and then I have the particular set of photos that I'm downloading. So this, you sort of have the, the archival hierarchy in, in both places, right? It exists yeah. in folders on your hard drive, and then it exists again here. Has that created any storage problems for you? Not yet. Okay. I have a pretty big hard drive uh, on my computer, and then I also have an external drive. I'm very old school. Cloud storage is great, but I also really like having an external hard drive. I'm like the only person I know that still uses one of those. But yep. um, yeah, yeah. I mean, you can you can see one on the shelf behind me. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> so not the only only one. Um, no, I haven't run into that yet. You know, okay. I think the experience of working in the Kais archive and having to really think about how I was going to use each document has made me a bit choosier about both photographing and downloading. Um, I think that was sort of formative for how I think about which documents I'm going to keep, 
right? Because right. I think there's a balance that you have to strike as a researcher between having everything and then having a usable amount of data. Sure, sure. Um, and so I would say I'm choosier than some people um, about what I'm going to photograph. And I think particularly what I certainly didn't appreciate when I was writing a dissertation is a dissertation is really teaching you how to write a book. Um, and then you figure that out. And now I think I'm just much more thoughtful when I'm doing research about what is the purpose of this document? Where is it going to go? You know, I have all of these databases and sort of organizational systems, but I also have a mental map of where things belong. Um, and, you know, sort of a idea of where this might fit when I'm actually putting it together as a book. And I didn't really have that the first time I did it. I was just thinking like, oh, that's interesting. I want that, I might need it later. And then ended up using, I don't know, maybe 10% of the documents I collected. Right, right, right. Um, so show us then, uh, so, so this is a great overview of like how, you know, how you've imported the research documents in, sort of some of the, the tagging, the yeah. search capabilities are really great in Devon thing. So you've, you've uploaded these, what comes next in your, in your workflow? Uh, so what I'm trying, to, the stage I'm at right now, having completed the archival research, or at least as much as I can do without going back to Mexico, is um, again, all of this cross-referencing, right? And one of the really nice things about DevonThink is you can search by archive, but you can just also search multiple databases at once. Um, so what I'm doing right now is thinking about thematic chapters. I also have some secondary sources um, that are digitalized that I've put into DevonThink. And so as I'm approaching each sort of thematic section of the book, one of the things I'm able to do is say, search for a person. Right. And bring up every document and secondary source I have that mentions that person, go through all of them, and then look at um, what are the surrounding documents? Literally, what is the archival context uh, for the document that mentions that person, right? Who were they uh, with on a particular day at a particular solidarity event? How does that get described in any relevant secondary literature? So I'm literally using Devon Think to both zoom in on particular people or things or themes or keywords, but then also zoom out by looking at what are the other documents in that folder that give me an idea of what that person was really up to, who were they collaborating with, what larger movements were they associated with, how has that been talked about in the secondary literature. I used to have to do all of that myself and Devon Think is allowing me to sort of create shortcuts to put those things together to start yeah. thinking about how do I assemble an entire article or an entire book chapter around these themes that I have pre-selected. Could you do a quick demo for us? Pick a name and sh show Ooh, us what comes I'm up. Trying to think of a good one that's actually gonna bring things up. Um, with the Camina. Um, well, let's just do like, how about Daniel Ortega? Okay. Let's see what comes. Okay, so I have a couple tags here that I have created, but then you can see, I mean- So it's, it's OCR, the primary source. Yeah. Um, and you can see the other nice thing about Devon Think is you can see that it's showing me which collection it's in at the same time. Right. Um, so again, that gives me the ability to sort of look at the larger context of each folder, right? I can go back and look at that entire folder. Um, Daniel Ortega is an interesting choice, I guess, for this particular yes. week. <laughs> but I knew it would bring things up. Right. Um, and so what you're seeing here is stuff that goes back to the 70s, stuff that goes up to the 90s in some cases. Um, where I'm able to track one person through the story that I've sort of, the larger story that I've amassed through pulling these archival collections together. What, what I really like about the way you're using OCR here is you're not just like, okay, here's a document about Ortega. I'm gonna move on to the next one. You're, you're think, using it to sort of guide you to sort of the contextual 
you know, the archival context of, of, of that particular document. Uh, so not just here's it coming up, what's around it. I think that's a really great strategy. Yeah, I mean, it's been really interesting because this has really changed how I do my research. For instance, right now, um, the primary source I'm working with is a 1200 page memoir of the Mexican president um, in the period I'm studying in the late seventies. And how do you engage with a 1200 page memoir? Um, right. How do you do that productively? The realistic thing is that I can't read that book cover to cover. Right. I just, I can't. Um, so what I've found is I'm just treating it like an archive and yeah. going through it page by page and thinking about, again, where does this piece of this person's account of their own life and work fit into what I'm trying to do? And then photographing those pages but keeping entire sections together, including pages that I wouldn't have necessarily included if I were only doing keywording so that I can see what his next point was. Right, right. Why this was important. And are you taking notes in Devon Think as well? Or are you just using it for organizing um, the images I'm themselves? just using it for organizing. Okay, okay, interesting. And okay. then I should say, I, I, I'm also using EndNote, um, which I know puts me in a, minority um yeah, that's pretty i school. started using EndNote in 2005 and it's just one of those things where i have just invested in that database and that is my database now and do you so is that where you take notes as well then i tend to take notes in word documents and okay. then file them with the archival collections i'm working okay. with okay that's that's good and I mean, the, the advantage of doing it in dev and think rather than just like on the in the finder uh, of the computer is these search results are going to be you know you've got this ranked column of score if you see the the yellow to red bars yeah. it's it's bringing it together in a way that um, spotlight won't uh, in finder I, I trust these search results more I know how to make sense of them better um, than yeah. the mess that spotlight brings up um, great you know I should say the other nice thing about well one of the many nice things about Devon Think is you can do multiple word searches as well yes. Yes. Um, so you could do Ortega, comma, Mexico, for instance. I'm, let's do it. I don't know that that will bring anything up, but we can try. Oh, there you go. Um, although I don't see where it mentions Mexico. Oh, there it is. There it is. Last word. Um, so, you know, I think about the work I did in my first book where I was trying to put together these, reconstruct these dialogues, if I had been able to bring up every document that said Carlos Vidal and Obregón might have saved me years, literally right. years. Right. Um, and how good it is uh, Devin think at batch OCRing? This is actually some, not something I've tried. What do you like, mean? Oh, it's so good. In order in order to OCR a document, you know, do you, are we talking one at a time? Can we do a whole folder at a time? You can batch them. Okay. I mean, this yeah. is, this has always been one of my concerns that I've said in other videos uh, and interviews um, around doing OCR, like front loading the OCR work at the beginning. Um, I mean, on the one hand, you don't necessarily know what you're looking for when you start a project. So it's not good in that way, but then also it may be a time investment that leads to nothing, but I think you've, you're making a good case for how with this, this particular program, it could be done in a meaningful way. I mean, I think I've done up to about a thousand at a time. Okay. That's great. That's great. And it take, it takes a while. Sometimes I have run it overnight. Yep. Yep. Um, but it can handle it. I, I will say I have found it exceptionally stable. Yes. Yes. That has been my experience. And I think I've been using Devon Think since, if not 2003, 2004. Wow. Probably. Now I'm mad that you didn't tell me about it. Ah, uh, see, this is as long as we've been, you know, as, for as long as we've been friends, there, um, there are advantages to Twitter and, and having these conversations um, out in public. Um, so, yeah. Um, so I've known you since about 2004, I think, uh, 2005. Um, it's okay, I'll forgive you someday. 
My conversation with Sarah prompted me to sit down and test DevonThink 3's optical character recognition capabilities. I've used DevonThink's OCR previously on PDFs of older articles or scan books so I, that I could annotate them on my iPad. I was interested here in finding out how much larger my digitized archival files would become if they were text searchable. One feature of DevonThink that I appreciate is the ability to both import files and index them. Importing files will copy them into DevonThink's database, which both takes up more hard drive space and risks removing folders from my existing organizational scheme. By contrast, indexing files in DevonThink retains their original location on your hard drive and doesn't take up additional storage space. A similar feature in DevonThink worth mentioning is the ability to replicate a file rather than copying it. This allows you to view and edit a single master file across multiple folders instead of contending with multiple versions and all the space that they take up. Let's go ahead and OCR sample documents from a digital archive in order to get a sense for how the process works. I'm actually going to add an additional step here, a hint that I gleaned from the DevonThink guide I linked to in the show description. A feature of DevonThink that I'd like to take greater advantage of is the ability to create automated workflows or utilize rules to batch process files. One great possibility when you're working with an archival collection is to create a rule that automatically OCRs any document entered into a specific folder, which would in essence allow you to OCR documents as you upload them from your camera or your phone. So I've created both a DevonThink database titled Documents and a folder on my hard drive titled New Archival Images. I'll go ahead and index that folder. I'll then control click and create a new smart rule, which I'll call import and OCR. Then from this drop down menu, I'll select the new archival images folder. In the next section, I'll change all to any and set a couple of rules. So I've changed one set of kind it is images, add another rule, kind is PDFs. I'll then have Devon Think perform the following action on import, selecting OCR. I finally have to add a couple more steps. One is move into database. And the last one is move the scanned uh, OCR documents into the documents database that I have created. With that set, let's drop a couple of un-OCR PDFs from a digital archive into the folder, the corresponding folder on the desktop. As you can see then in the lower left, DevonThink has started OCRing those files. I sped that up for you. It took about seven minutes to do roughly 150 pages. And those PDFs are now OCR'd and we'll look at the outputs in a moment. First though, I'll mention that DevonThink also has a number of pre-installed templates for rules and other actions. If you are interested in just importing a bunch of PDFs into a database to then OCR, one handy possibility is PDFs Not Searchable, which will create a group that shows you which of your imported PDFs are awaiting OCR. Let's try another option for OCR. The majority of documents that I digitize in the archives are formatted as individual JPEGs. Earlier, I ran OCR on JPEGs that I photographed in Columbia's National Archive in 2018. The indexed folder has about 260 files, which took a couple of hours to process. As you can see here, DevonThink created a PDF from each JPEG within the same folder on my hard drive and indexed the PDFs in the database. To my surprise, the PDFs are only about a quarter the size of the original files. Let's see what the OCR produced. The archival folder contains the judicial records of three late 20th century inmates, one of whom was sentenced for kidnapping. If we search for kidnapping, sequestro, we can see the results. However, the first page of this PDF also shows the limits of OCRing primary sources. DevonThink can't recognize the information that was originally typed into the fields on this form, which leads me to two pieces of advice. First, be sure you have a sense for what's in your documents. If you're going to OCR a bunch of records, take the time to read a couple of pages on either side of the term you're searching for. Determine what the OCR might miss. You might therefore flag pages like this one for direct reading or come up with alternate search terms. Error testing OCR output is a subject that's receiving increased attention in 
the digital humanities field, and we historians will be well served to remember that OCR is not a perfect technological fix. This leads me to my second recommendation. As I've also explained at greater length in other videos, I would hesitate to OCR all of my documents at the start, because I don't necessarily know what I'm looking for. Talking with Sarah has helped me realize that this might be different if you're working on a second book project and have a more established sense for doing research. However, if you're obtaining a set of dozens or hundreds or even thousands of documents from a digitized collection, rather than photographing them yourself in the archive, I would take a couple of days to skim as many pages of the documents as possible to build that sense of what the documents might contain. Back to the interview with Sarah. So any, any f final I mean, comments? I think, yeah, I think um, I'm someone who's always been pretty open to looking for new solutions. Um, finding software faster for me. I know a lot of historians that don't even use citation software. Right, right. To me, why would you format a footnote by hand if you don't have to? Right. I think it's easy to sort of find something that works for you and stick with it. And I, I sort of understand staying in your comfort zone if you have written a book or three books using a particular system. Um, but I feel like this software in particular, and I swear I'm not, it's, it's not a paid endorsement. <laughs> well, as there are no paid endorsements it, on research it really, crafts. Um, Devin think, call me. Um, I, I think this software, at least for me, fit very organically into yes. what I was trying to do anyway. Yes. But just made those things less laborious and less time consuming and more streamlined um, in a way that honestly, I'm just very profoundly grateful for. Yes, absolutely, absolutely. I think it was on Twitter where you said, Go ahead. Devin thing has changed my life. Uh, and, and I was so excited to hear that. So it's been great to sit down with you and, and see how you're making use of it. I, it's been fun to talk about it. It's uh, fun to nerd, about, nerd out about something that actually yes. <laughs> really has changed the quality of my life as a researcher. Awesome. Well, maybe we'll have you hop on uh, sometime, you know, a couple months down the road or next year and tell us how you're using it now, um, follow-up interview. Great. But this has been really awesome. Thank you again um, for coming on. This is an awesome project. Um, so glad to see you and get a sense, a better sense for, for how you work as a historian. So thank you. Likewise, thanks for having me. It's so awesome. nice to see you and nice to talk to you about this stuff. Sarah realized after we wrapped up our conversation that she didn't have a chance to talk about other research practices that she's added recently, particularly as it relates to digitizing documents in the archives. She was kind enough to record this short clip to follow up on our conversation. So just a few final thoughts about a couple things. Uh, I mentioned that I recently replaced the camera that I had been using to take archival photos um, since I did my dissertation research. So for about the past 14 or 15 years. It held up fantastically well. I was very happy with it. I did not feel like I needed a fancier, larger, um, more feature-packed camera. I was very happy with the simple point and shoot for my purposes. Uh, but the autofocus broke recently, and especially because archival lighting conditions can be so unpredictable and so variable, uh, you're not allowed to use a flash because the light can be damaging to paper. Um, the autofocus uh, was a very necessary feature on a relatively simple camera. So after consulting with some colleagues, after asking around uh, about what people are using and why, I settled on uh, replacing my camera with an iPad mini. Um, mini, again, because for me, uh, portability is really important. I'm traveling around Mexico City. I don't want to be carrying a big heavy bag. Um, I often already have books with me, whatever. The, the portability is important. And then the other um, important element of size and weight is thinking again about the physicality of research and holding something up over documents on a research table for sometimes hours at a time. Um, the other sort of thing that is changing with this move that I've made um, from the camera to the iPad is, again, on the recommendation of colleagues after asking people um, for recommendations and suggestions as I was looking to replace my hardware setup for um, photographing documents. 
Um, I've also started using Scanner Pro software. So I'm taking photos of archival documents and converting them to PDFs as part of that process, which takes out that middle step that I was previously doing of converting image files to PDFs and then running them through the optical character recognition on DevonThink. So it's quite nice in that way in that it eliminates one of those processing steps uh, before I even get into the tagging and organizing of documents. Um, the other nice thing is that Scanner Pro software has a lot of nice features that are really helpful. Um, it squares off corners, it makes sure the page is lined up correctly, even if I don't have the camera lined up exactly right to get a perfect rectangular document, which is surprisingly difficult. Um, so I'm getting really good results in my preliminary experiments, again, with the new iPad and with this new software. And, you know, all of these things um, bring up the larger point that all of what we do when we're coming up with our own research practices and methods uh, is collaborative. We do a lot of improvisation uh, on our own in archives in circumstances we're not necessarily able to predict or expect. Uh, we come up with systems for organization, with new catalogs, with new cataloging systems every time we enter a different archive or even a different collection within an archive that we're already familiar with. But so much of this is also about asking for recommendations and talking to friends and talking to colleagues and meeting people in archives and seeing what other people are doing uh, to approach these same problems and challenges that we all face doing historical research. One last thing um, about the iPad mini, here it is. I bought a case for it, which was a case that was just very similar to the one I had on a larger personal iPad previously. Um, I actually find that the case gets in the way uh, because I'm trying to hold it up over a page to photograph things and I have this extra thing I either have to hold up or keep out of the way of the camera. So I'm thinking uh, that when I'm able to go back to archives in Mexico, hopefully soon, um, I will get rid of this case and just buy a neoprene sleeve and then just hold the iPad itself um, over documents. Um, again, just to sort of take out this additional physical challenge of holding the iPad, holding the case, and getting a nice clear image of a document uh, without a lot of trouble or time because, um, of course, archival time is always extremely precious. My second guest is John Marks, Senior Manager of Strategic Initiatives at the American Association for State and Local History, where he also directs the Public History Research Lab. John holds a PhD from Rice University and is author of the 2020 book, Black Freedom in the Age of Slavery, Race, Status, and Identity in the Urban Americas. Okay. John, thank you so much both for coming on Research Craft and, and actually for being part of the inspiration for my uh, starting this series in the first place. We had a, a brief video chat last summer where you showed me how you, you were using DevonThink and it was really both helpful for me in thinking about that particular piece of software, but also in wanting to begin to have these conversations about research methods. So uh, it's great to talk to you again. Yeah, thanks for thanks for having me. And I'm glad my my fumbling through some methodology question with you last summer has been, uh, been instrumental. In some I mean, fumbling through methodology questions could also be the title of this series. So <laughs> um, anyway, so why don't you tell us a little bit about uh, the dissertation project that became your first book and how you organized uh, research materials for that. And then we'll, we'll get into talking about your current work and your use of Dev and Think. Sure. So, so my first book uh, is a transnational study of, of free people of color in the urban Americas. Um, and so it was very much a, uh, a social history project. Uh, so I tried to compare free communities of color in Charleston, South Carolina, and in Cartagena, Colombia, um, in the early, early 19th century, for the most part. Um, and, and doing a project like that uh, involves trying to track a lot of individual people across a pretty wide range uh, of different types of documents, um, especially when you're working in two different national contexts. Um, and you know, I, I conducted research on the three continents for that project. Um, and so it was uh, a lot of different, different streams of, of research that I was trying to, to make speak to each other. Um, and 
you know, I, I wish I could say that I had this holistic approach of how I was going to organize my research when I when I went into it, uh, but I, I definitely didn't. Uh, I but I did use uh, eventually ended up using uh, an earlier version of Dev and Think for that uh, for that dissertation project, um, and so was trying to uh, you know, keep my transcriptions of uh, archival documents that I was doing um, of you know petitions for the legislature in South Carolina and things like that. Um, kept those in text files and then I and I organized those folders in in Devon Think um, and then I uh, I tried to uh, I tried to create usable data in a lot of ways from some of the some of the primary sources that I was finding um, so I ended up working in a lot of Excel spreadsheets uh, mm -hmm. in a way that I, I definitely did not anticipate doing when I when I started graduate school or even when I started the project I think that'd be the sort uh, for most of us yeah yeah, so like looking at things like, you know, uh, you know, the 19th century censuses, the decennial census in, in Charleston, um, looking at uh, a colonial census in Cartagena, um, a later uh, artisan census that they did of all the neighborhoods. Um, it had all this really rich information about race and occupation and um, you know, spatial relationships about where people were living and who they were living near cool. um, and what kinds of relationships they might have. But it's really hard to tease that stuff out when you're just working from uh, working from the archival documents themselves or working from, you know, from a picture of that document. Um, and so I really wanted to be able to put it into something quantifiable. Um, and so I was taking kind of painstakingly uh, taking those handwritten archival censuses um, and putting them into Excel spreadsheets so that I could say say things, you know, like X percentage of free people of color were barbers in Charleston and, you know, this percentage were barbers in Cartagena or the most popular occupations among free people of color in both cities were things like tailors and shoemakers and stonemasons, uh, for example. Um, and so I ended up be working in this sort of uh, quantitative space that I, that I didn't anticipate, um, but that ended up, ended up being really productive. Um, but I think the biggest thing that I wish I had done differently with my, uh, my, my dissertation and my book research that, that I was trying to solve as I approached the second project is that my notes and research in secondary sources were almost completely separate from the, the notes and research I was doing with, with primary sources. Um, and so, you know, I would read PDFs and highlight them um, and, you know, did a not great job of actually taking notes and writing down my thoughts uh, after reading a reading an article or reading a book. Um, and so I ended up going back to things multiple times. Um, and I didn't have a really clear way to look at all of that at the same time, right? Um, to be able to say, these are the things that I, you know, I found in this in this article, and this is how it relates to this primary source. And I can look at both of those at the same time as I'm as I'm writing this chapter. Um, but uh, and, and so that's something that I've been thinking about as I'm approaching a new project. Yeah. Um, but but with the book, I ended up working and doing my writing, uh, or with the dissertation, ended up doing my writing in Scrivener. Um, mm -hmm. And so I was really happy to have worked in, uh, you know, to developed a lot of text files, um, just plain text files for a lot of my research notes and a lot of my transcriptions, because it made it really easy to just drag those into, into Scrivener and have a screen, you know, have half my screen uh, that, uh, that is my primary source and the other half uh, is, is my writing. Um, and I think uh, that worked in ways that um, it wouldn't have, wouldn't have worked if I was using, um, you know, some other kind of note-taking platform that, right. uh, you know, didn't allow you to export things. To right, them. right. Well, I, I saw recently that the new version of Devon Think, the new version of Scrivener, you can actually just drag and drop uh, text from one to the other, which I'm excited to try once I upgrade my Scrivener for my new laptop. Yeah, that's great news. I'm far away from beginning to, to write anything except notes to myself. Um, so that is, uh, is good to know. I'm somewhere in the not too distant future, I'll be yeah. able to take advantage of that. Yeah. Well, so tell us about your really cool new projects. Yeah, <laughs> thanks. Uh, I, so I'm working on my second book now. Um, and in short, I, I'm writing about the lives in freedom of the 123 people enslaved and then emancipated by George Washington. So uh, George Washington, uh, in his will, he uh, declared that the enslaved people that he owned outright, uh, which doesn't count the enslaved people that were owned by his wife's estate, uh, the 123 people that he owned uh, would be free after his death and after the death of Martha Washington, after that, the death of his wife. And so uh, I, I wanted to write the story of what happens to those people in their lives in freedom. 
right? Some of these, uh, you know, some of them are, you know, in their 70s and 80s when they gain their freedom, but many more of them are children, are teenagers when they gain their freedom in, in 1801. Washington dies in 1799. Martha Washington sort of fears for her life uh, the next year because all these people know that she, her life is the only thing oh. standing between them and freedom. Um, and so she says they, you know, they'll all be emancipated early uh, in, in 1801. Um, and, uh, that story is, you know, is pretty well known. People know that Washington was an enslaver of a huge number of people, and they know that he emancipated them in his will. But it's always treated kind of as the end of a story about Washington and slavery, and the end of a story about you know, early America and the Revolution, and sort of the, the complicated dynamics of race and slavery and the nation founded on the on these concepts of freedom and equality. Um, but I want to treat it as the beginning of a story about Black freedom in the early 19th century United States. Um, and so uh, similar to my first project, it involved a lot of trying, to, even more so actually than my first project, it involved trying to track specific individuals across time and across space through a wide variety of documents wherever I could find them. Um, and so as I started approaching this project and thinking about how I wanted to organize things, um, I knew I wanted to try to avoid some of the some of the pitfalls that I fell into when I was uh, when I was doing my the research for my first book project. Great. Well, why don't we jump into Devon Think and you can show us maybe how you're using that to to get around this problem that you had, this challenge you had with your first book. Yeah. So when when I so I ended up you know finding finding Devon Think and it, I, I like it because it solves a couple of of issues that I was that I was having. Um, so the thing, sort of my requirements for a new research platform was that I wanted everything to be in the same place. Like I mentioned, I wanted my secondary sources, my primary sources, and all my notes about both of them to be in one place. Um, and I wanted I wanted everything in a simple format, right? I wanted to create the folder structure myself. Yes. I wanted that those folders to live in Dropbox where yes. everything else that I have lives. Um, and I didn't want them to be stuck in some proprietary platform. So I've used Evernote before um, in graduate school for other notes taking but I just really didn't like the way notes are kind of stuck in Evernote. Um, there's obviously some workarounds but I didn't like the way that they were stuck there. So I really wanted something that could live just in a simple folder structure but also was uh, you know could be put into this other platform to be made you know more powerful. Um, and then the sort of social history nature of the project meant that I wanted a way to really track these individual people across these different, as they appear in these different documents and have reference to them in other secondary sources. So I wanted something that would allow me to link together all of these different sources, um, to use wiki linking, wiki linking and to use tagging in really powerful ways um, that I could, I could make all these connections and could help me visualize these, the, these connections and maybe help me find some ones that I didn't realize were there. Um, and so uh, I had used Devon Think in my dissertation, but the new version of Devon Think, yeah. Devon Think 3, um, is a lot pa more powerful, I think, and a lot cleaner and simpler yes. than the earlier versions. Um, and it's really been really been fun to use. So I will uh, I will share my screen and sort of show you what uh, what I've been doing in Devon Think. Um, so I will say that you know I'm I'm not an expert here, and um, I've just kind of been working been working my way through it. But I but I've really been liking it. So um, I can show you, for example. Um, so one of the things I've done is I've created individual notes for individual people. Um, so actually, we'll start we'll start at the beginning. Uh, so I have a folder for primary source research and a folder for secondary sources and notes. Um, within my primary source research folder, I again, and this is how I did things in my dissertation project, I'm organizing things by the source, by the archive, by, by the place that I'm finding it um, in the sort of you know, highest, highest level I can. Um, so here among the papers of George Washington, um, I have his about six months before he died, he took an inventory of his estate, including a list of all of the enslaved people that were living at Mount Vernon and the, the surrounding estates. Um, and so I have, I, I took that, uh, thankfully it's been transcribed uh, by, by the papers of George Washington, um, but I took it and put it into a, a, a spreadsheet that was a little bit more easily sortable and, um, and a little bit more useful for my purposes. Could you, uh, just do, and, could you, could you zoom in at all? Would that be possible? Yeah, let's see. 
I can open it up in its own window. I first created this spreadsheet uh, out of the uh, out of this inventory of enslaved people. I first created it just in a simple Google Sheet, um, and then I was able to save that and import it into into Devon Think. Um, so I'll I'll show you the version that uh, is in Google Sheets just because it's uh, a little easier to see, but it functions basically the same in, in Dev and Think. Um, and so the, the list that was uh, transcribed by the papers of George Washington um, has all this information, but it wasn't sorted uh, sorted exactly into columns. Um, and I wanted a way to, uh, to you know, make connections between individuals, between their family members um, in a way that, that wasn't there in just the transcription of, uh, of this slave list. So I went through um, and did you know, just writing their names, occupations where they existed, sex where, where it was mentioned, age where it was mentioned. Um, the, the biggest part of it was noting who the owner of the slave was, whether it was owned by Washington um, or whether it was owned by uh, whether, what they called the dower slave, so owned by the estate of Martha Washington's first husband. Um, and so I can uh, can show you all of them. Um, and then there's all these relationships within these, uh, you know, that are noted within the document that I wanted to create links to. Um, so there were, you know, people noted that they were, uh, you know, their connection to to a spouse who was, you know, maybe living on another part of the plantation or on one of these, you know, outlying farms, um, that they had children uh, who were, you know, often listed with the mother separate from, from where the father was. Um, so I I created this um, this family ID category basically, and every time I found a family unit, I, I just went to the next number, and that way I could keep these people together um, and or and sort them in a way that that kept them together. Uh, and so this was really important for me because once some of you know some of these individuals are slave, enslaved people owned by Washington that are married to someone owned by uh, by. Martha Washington. And so when one of them is freed, the other remains enslaved. Um, you know, these are all hints of where this person might go. If they had a family that remained enslaved at Mount Vernon, they might have remained close by. Um, if their whole family was emancipated, they had might have had a little bit more flexibility in, in where they went in the years afterwards. Um, and just knowing you know, knowing these names is sort of the first place that I was able that I was able to look um, to you know, have any hope of finding them in the documents. Um, obviously, the biggest challenge working with this is that the vast majority are not, you know, are not given any surnames. Um, almost all of them. These surnames are mostly ones that I've found in subsequent sources and then have been able to work back into uh, into this this sort of master spreadsheet. Um, but just to uh, to go back to to Devon Think. Um, so I have this list of people. I have this list at least of first names. Um, and in Virginia, there's a law passed in, in the early 19th century that all free people of color have to register their freedom every three years at the county courthouse. Uh, the vast majority don't do this. Um, some do it one time and never do it again. Um, but it was at least a place to start to try to track these individual people. Um, and so I was able to go into the uh, the Fairfax County court records um, and find the, the register of free blacks. And this is a PDF, you know, these are PDF scans of, of that document. Um, and I see, I see um, under the file type uh, that it, the kind of file uh, that it, this has been OCR. Was it OCR when you downloaded it or did you OCR uh, it with Devin Think or another program? Yeah, great question. Uh, so it was not OCR. Um, so I was able to Bring it into Devon Think and just pretty quickly um, add OCR to it so that I could, uh, you know, could do a search for it. You know, could search within the document, could more easily highlight within the document in in ways that made sense. So this document was sort of one of the first places I started. Um, it's an index to these free Black registrations, uh, these registrations of of Black freedom. Um, and so, you know, this is more or less how they all look. Um, these are, you know, this is some, these are transcriptions of the original doc, of the original documents, but I was researching, starting this research during COVID, um, and this is, this is what I was able to get my hands on, which ended up, ended up being really useful. Um, and thankfully, several of these have referenced specifically that a person, you know, it, uh, they all mention where this person received their freedom. And so several of them mentioned George Washington by name. Um, and I was able to go through pretty quickly finding finding the ones that that actually mentioned Washington. And what I like about Devin Think um, is that I was able to, to go through this register um, and I was able to take notes um, and just put my notes of, you know, where I wanted to, uh, you know, what, what, what items in the book I wanted to look at um, and uh, to, you know, to do that 
to do that pretty quickly. Right. And I, I should say for people who aren't familiar with Devon Think, you could double click on one of these other note files and open it up in a separate window. You're not sort of bound to this one sort of flat pane, right? So you can have multiple things yeah. open at the same time, which makes it convenient to check notes against each other to read one thing against another. Yeah, so I can open I can open my PDF over here and I can have, Great. Um, you know, I can I don't have to go you know, flipping, scanning back and forth or flipping back and forth through an index. I can, um, you know, I can just have them both here and say, these are the ones I want from book two. Um, and so I can go to, you know, book two page, whatever it is 20 right right 23 and then i can you know find some of these these people pretty quickly and we can and, transcribe and i'll say one other advantage to doing something like this with multiple windows in devon think as opposed to you know having a bunch of word documents open is when you search in devon think it will search not just in the document you have open but across you know all the documents in your database which is a, a big big plus yeah, and so it's, you know, if there were, I don't, you know, if there was an individual person that was mentioned in documents that I hadn't found already, it's more likely that Devin Think is going to find that for me than, um, than if I was working across, you know, just an acrobat and a Word document, for example. Um, but as I found these individual people in the, uh, you know, in these free black registrations, I started, uh, I started creating people notes, because um, if I found them here, I, ha I had a good sense that I was going to be able to find them elsewhere as well. Um, so I can show you um, how that works. I found this person in the Fairfax County Free Black Register, book two, uh, item 167, uh, which is on page 70. And what I really like about Devin Think is that all I had to do to make this link, you know, back to the Fairfax County Free Black Register, um, all I had to do in order to do that was um, was to type in exactly how I have the title, Fairfax County Free Black Register. And it just creates a link to it automatically. Wow, okay. I, I had, you hadn't even shown me that, I think, uh, when we talked last summer. That's really great. Yeah, so that, you know, so that is really helpful. And again, you know, underneath it, the same thing. Uh, it's the, uh, you know, I have, you know, I found this woman, Thomas and Gray, who comes up in the records a couple of times. Uh, I have, you know, I found her in the Washington, in the 1799 slave list. Uh, so I have her in the Washington slave list, 1799. Um, and it creates that, it creates that link, um, which is, which is really, really helpful. And then you'll see in, uh, in some of the notes uh, that I've written, written for myself, um, you know, I have, uh, I have some questions for myself and you know some things are transcriptions from documents other things are notes to myself so i try to write you know narrative or or notes down here while cool. i'm uh, saying like this is who i think this person because you read these things and you think you're going to remember them and you never do always uh, write it down and, always write it uh, down and and so i, I tried to make a good uh, a, a good effort at, as i started this of like this is who this person is this is who i think they're related to um but if i think uh, you know so i so this person is the daughter of Dick and Charity, who were, uh, you know, were enslaved by uh, by Washington. Um, and so, if I wanted to, you know, if I had a, I don't have a note for them because I haven't found them anywhere else. Um, but if I had them, you know, say, you can see here, like her, she gives birth to someone named John Gray, and all I have to write is, you know, I put them all last name, first name. Right. Um, and if you want to see who that is, um, you can just click on that. Right, link and it'll and jump find... you to this other file yeah right. and and, um, and so this is wiki linking just just to yes. put the 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 name on the practice because uh, you'd mentioned that earlier um and i think you can change in the preferences how the wiki link appears so you have it last name first name with no space in between i think there are a couple other options for formatting yeah and so i mean that that was just how i was the easiest way for me to organize people and so the reason the wiki linking is is work you know it automatically creates that wiki link because i'm typing something that is essentially a file name in in devon thing um and i think if we go back to uh you know to this initial one to thomas and gray something that as i add more documents in here and as i do do additional research and i'm writing additional names something that i think will eventually be helpful um is it will show you over in this tab over here um you know it'll show you some of the items that are are related mm -hmm. to you know that, that seem closely related to it um so here uh, you know these are groups that are closely related and these down here are documents that are close, closely related um so 
obviously this is the one that we're on, um, Thomas and Gray. Um, and then it thinks that, you know, because of the, some of the words and, and uh, context clues that are in here that, um, you know, the file for Jasper Morris uh, or the note for Jasper Morris is, is closely, closely related to it or Morris Jasper rather is closely related to it. Um, and, you know, I don't know whether that's true or not exactly right now, um, but as I add more in, I think these things will get more useful and, um, and it can help point you in the right direction to, you know, to connections that you maybe hadn't thought of already. Um, and so this is just another one, you know, another example of a, of a person note that I have going, that I, someone that I found in a lot of different, uh, a lot of different sources, right? So I found mm -hmm. them in, uh, found this person, Morris Jasper, in two different of the three Black registers, and those links will go there. I found them in the 1850 census, um, and that'll bring you uh, you know, to the, to the 1850 census um, page that I have downloaded um, for connecting him. Um, and he's somewhere on here. I will uh, go through looking, looking at that list for now, uh, and, you know, and go forwards and backwards. Um, I found him referenced in, uh, in a newspaper article um, describing his, his death as um, alleged in 1872, allegedly as the last of the enslaved people owned by Washington uh, who to die. There's lots of people who claim that to be true. Um, I found multiple of them, some of them who I don't think were even enslaved by Washington to begin with, which is a sort of interesting part of this project I'm looking forward to exploring. But um, again, if you, you know, because I have, you know, have this linked to the newspaper, uh, you know, I can, I can click that and go, you know, go straight to that, go straight to that note. Um, which uh, which works really well. And so it lets me follow up, you know, as I, you know, I'm going to be writing about, I'm imagining anyway, I'll be writing about these people at different times, at different points in the book, connecting them to different chapters. Um, and this is a way of keeping it together, keeping the notes and sources together that I can go through and, and find all these things, all these places that I found this person and get to those documents pretty quickly without opening a thousand different files and without trying to remember where I saved things and where I, where I found that person um, and having a bunch of different documents. Um, and so this was, I mean, when I realized that it could do some of these things, it was, uh, it was pretty exciting for me. Um, and, uh, and then, uh, and I think it's going to continue, uh, continue to be, to be useful for me. Um, uh, well, I've been using Devon Think for, I don't know, 17 years or something, maybe even longer than that. And I've, you've just shown me a totally different way to, to make use of the software. So this is, this is pretty incredible. Yeah. And some of the other things that I like about it, um, you know, so these are all, all individual people, which is, was an, is an important way for me to organize it, but I can add, and that's, you know, in my file structure, right? right. And, um, and Sorry, and so let, let, can, me pa let me pause you for a second. Each of those names is a plain text file or a rich text that's file, correct. correct? Right. Uh, yeah, mostly plain text file. So I can show you here, this is my, you know, in my writing folder, this is the tentative name of the project, Lives and Liberty. Great um, title. And so this is my, uh, my primary source research, right? So you can see, uh, you know, this, fol this folder is just indexed to here, to this primary source research. Um, so if I, uh, you know, open this up, uh, if I create a new folder, um, pretty soon, uh, at least I think it's indexed to here. Yeah, that will end up in this, uh, in this primary source research file, um, at least if I index it correctly, it will. Um, and so, you know, you can, I can make changes here and that's, and that's simple, but you'll see, um, uh, let's see, where are we? Uh, oh no, we're in, we're looking at people. So each of these, um, you know, these are all just, these are where the text files are. Um, you know, if you look at, this is the Derek family, um, you know, these four text files are in Devon Think. These four text files are just in my folder structure, right. backed up, backed up to Dropbox, which yeah. is really, really important to me. So if I need, you know, if uh, I decide, you know what, I'm done using Dev and Think because some other new thing has come out that I want to start using, um, I can pretty easily, I think, uh, take all these files and, um, and and bring them somewhere else. Um, right. You know, text files are, are pretty portable. Um, and so that should, should, you know, if that should come to pass, that that'll be an easy transition to make. Right, right. And this is what you were referring to earlier in the interview about sort of the, the transparency in the, the file hierarchy, uh, which is one of the things I am always insisting on is really important, whether it's organizing archival photographs or, or note files like this.
yeah and and so i can just make endless levels here right um which is always one of my frustrations with evernote was that you know you have notebooks and notes and stacks of notebooks and you know so you're limited to kind of three levels and so i'm always adjusting things based on how you know how to make it fit within three levels and when i transitioned here i can you know and i did this with my dissertation work too that however the archive that i'm working with is organized that's how i can that, that's how i can organize it with that many folders right. um, even if it ends up being a, a complicated file path right um right. but but that's my that's the file structure that's in here uh, but i you know i needed to be able to do some additional things um, yeah show us tagging tag, and that's where tagging comes in which is which is really helpful um so one of the ways that i've used it is to um to identify uh what i what i start calling gen 1 gen 2 gen 3 people um so there are individuals who were enslaved by washington and emancipated in his 1799 will uh and then there are the children of those people. Uh, and then there are the grandchildren of those people. And they all get mentioned in the records and they often get mentioned together. And I don't know where the project is going yet. Um, so I don't know how important it is to me to know, to focus just on the people who were actually emancipated by Washington or to focus just on the people who were, uh, the children of the people who were emancipated by Washington. Um, but that's not something that I'm gonna build into the file structure. And so I can do that with tagging. Uh, so I can, uh, you know, so for example, these are all the individual people that I have tagged as Gen 1. And so of the 123 people uh, emancipated by Washington, uh, I have uh, enslaved and emancipated by Washington. I found 37 of them in, in some other record so far, um, which considering that none of them have any surnames listed with them in the, uh, in his, uh, that 1799 inventory feels like a great success already. Um, but these are, you know, all their individual, uh, all their individual note files, and all the places that I found them. Um, again, with their, uh, with their appropriate wiki links to other people and to other documents and things like that. Uh, and then the, I've also found, you know, 48 people that are these Gen 2 individuals, the children of those people emancipated by Washington. Um, and some of those end up with really interesting, uh, really interesting stories as well of, you know, later in their lives, they're sort of claiming this link to Washington um, that they didn't have in practice. Uh, you know, they weren't ever enslaved by Washington or they were, you know, uh, you know, they were born just after their parents were emancipated by Washington, but they're claiming this link in the 1850s and 1860s. Um, and so wanting to be able to remember to identify them as Gen 2 people right. And not and not someone else. Um, and so I'm still kind of playing around with how this is going to work. Um, and I haven't, you know, I've been working in a pretty limited number of documents so far um, or of archival sources, just because I've I haven't traveled, uh, I haven't been anywhere. I've been fortunate to um, to be able to research some some tax records and things like that on microfilm uh, at uh, through through interlibrary loan. Um, but I as I do more research and as I'm finding more people and I'm looking at new sources, I'm sure I'll come up with new new tags that I can um, can use or should be using. Uh, but that is you know a, a way of adding additional organization to to these people and to these files that I'm working through yeah. without actually building it into the, the file structure itself. Could you show us just very briefly how you at, go about adding a tag in Devon Think? Sure. Um, so uh, let's see. Let's say I wanted to do it with Alice Derrick, um, who I found in, in a pretty large number of sources. Um, uh, so I, uh, uh, so, you know, you click on the note in this tab over in this uh, panel over here are, you know, all of the, uh, are all of the properties for this plain text document. Um, it is really nice that I can add an alias, uh, an alias to it if I need to. I'll get back to that in a second. But tags are pretty simple over here. So if I wanted to, um, you know, if I wanted to add a tag that uh, she lived in Alexandria, caps that she lived in Alexandria, and want to keep my Alexandria people separate from my, um, you know, from my Fairfax County people separate from my DC people uh, or something like that, um, just type tab. And now I have a new tag for for Alexandria, which um, should then uh, yeah should then show up here. Uh, Alexandria, one person, Derek Alice. Um, and so uh, that you know, and as far as I know, there's not any limit on on how many tags that you can include, right. um, which is which is really helpful. 
Um, I, be I believe you can also train Dev and Think to automatically apply tags. Um, I played around a little bit with that when I first downloaded Dev and Think 3, but didn't get super far. I'm, I'm not convinced for the kind of work, the file management that we're doing as historians, that it's necessarily worth the time to train the AI to do it. Um, but one thing, yeah. one really little thing that I like about uh, this demonstration you just gave us, Alexandria is now alphabetized. The tags are in alphabetical order. Uh, even yeah. though you added it as the third one, it's now the first. That's 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 a nice touch. Yeah, and I mean the fact, and I can also, you know, I mean you can do all sorts of, um, you know, all sorts of organizing that I think, you know, I should be able to do it. Uh, well, I, it shows you how many, you know, how many items are are tagged for each of them, um, and you know, just doing it by size, you can see how many, um, you know who has the, you know, the biggest, either the biggest files or the most files um, under there. Um, but yeah, it is nice that it organizes it automatically um, with, and I haven't used that, um, you know, that auto tagging or the tagging suggesting suggestion feature that you're talking about. Um, but I will say that Devon Think 3 is probably the only application I've ever had on my computer that I didn't tell it to turn off the like little tip of the day thing that yes. comes up um, because they like, I mean, I am scratching the surface of what Devon Think can do. Like, I, like, I really feel like it's something that is trying, it's, you know, it's knowledge management. Um, and I think can, in a lot of ways can get uh, as, as complex uh, as, as you want it to. And so I often do, you know, every time I open it, I'm looking at what that little tip of the day is because it's like, oh, I didn't know you could do that. Likewise, um, you know, yeah. Like, you know, sometimes, sometimes I want, it's something I want to look into. Uh, sometimes I, you know, it's not. Um, but one, one helpful thing that uh, is this alias feature, um, and I can, can get to that in, in a second, um, uh, or maybe I'll do it as I go to, to secondary sources, but um, I can give this file a, a separate name. Um, you know, so if I wanted to give it a, you know, a first name, first name, no space, last name as, as its alias, um, it, that won't be the file name. The file name will still be the way that I want it. Um, but I can give it that alias, and then the alias works in for the auto wiki tagging uh, or wiki linking the same way the file name does. So now I can write Alice Derek. Uh, I was supposed to be able to write Alice Derek uh, and and have it uh, probably have to do it won't link to form. itself. Yeah. Yeah. Um, let's see. Yeah, and so now um, it you know it can do it with with the alias too, which is really helpful in secondary sources because you always, at least I always have secondary sources where the year and the author name is one thing, but in my head, it's always, um, you know, it's always that, that book, or it's always the, you know, uh, this article, or I'm thinking of it by title. So I can add that in as an alias while still keeping um, the, my file names uh, clean and, and uniform, which ends up. Ends up that's, a, that's a really great suggestion. After speaking with John, I tried enabling wiki links in my dev and think. You can link between documents manually or choose one of several options for having the program do it automatically. I selected the options that John had enabled and immediately ran into a hiccup. It turns out that I had imprecisely named notes files scattered throughout my database. This is less of an issue if you're using Dev and Think for a new project, like John and Sarah are, but in my case, I have 15 years worth of notes. For instance, as you can see in the navigation bar here, in a folder about the Colombian government's post-conflict rehabilitation programs of the late 1950s, I had a notes file named for a city. In another example, I had a file simply called 1962 within a folder for a single small archive. Wikilinks would link to these files any time the city name or year appeared in my notes, which is a lot. This is a valuable lesson here about precise file naming practices. A second problem is the use of what Devon Think calls mashed words. This could work well for you, but in my case, I have my own system of mashed abbreviations for Colombian government ministries. This, for example, is the Foreign Relations Ministry. There is no file in Devon Think with this title, so Wikilinks will create a new file with that name. Convenient for some, less so for me. So if we go to preferences, we can select a third option for Wikilinks, square brackets. And this is what I think I'll use from now on. Actually, doing this raised a feature I didn't know about. Using square brackets generates an autofill menu that will pop up every name of notes files within Dev and Think. This is one great reason to have conversations about research like this because it can lead you to features and software that you wouldn't have otherwise known about. Back to my interview with John. Um, will you show us more about how you use this for secondary sources too? 
Yeah, so like I said at the beginning, um, I, I wanted something that could keep all of my secondary secondary sources in there, as well as all of my um, as well as all of my uh, my, my primary sources. Um, and so uh, the, for secondary sources, I am uh, you know, and I just have a couple in here because I originally started with something different and I'm kind of um, moving them in. But I've mostly been doing um, you know been doing primary research so far. But for example. Um, you know, this is my secondary sources and notes. This is my article. I have them all um, organized by, um, you know, author name and author name and publication year, um, just to, to keep them all keep them all uniform. Um, but there's some really really great features for for how this works. Um, you know, so for example, um, you know, this is a, a 2017 article that um, is one of the the few that really. Um, Really goes into any detail on the experiences of these people, or at least a small group of these people. Um, and so I have the PDF in here, and I have my my notes on it in here. Um, and so just having those together is really helpful, um, you know. And the notes the notes file I just have you know, the same as the PDF the article file um, with underscore notes after it, um, which is great. Um, but one of the great things that you can do with Devin think that um, you know there's other ways to do it like I know you can do it with with Zotero which is how I did it originally but yep. having it all together is awesome um, so if I want to you know if I want to hi highlight a bunch of things right um, let's say I you know, found all these meaningful um, I'll just you know do a couple real quick um, you, know, you can highlight stuff uh, yeah, and then I will we'll close it I will save it. And again, these are all just indexed to files in, in my Dropbox, which is great. Um, but then if I go to that, if I go to that PDF, now it's got the highlights saved in it. Um, I can go to tools, summarize highlights, and I can do it either as a markdown file, a rich text file, or a sheet. So I can, let's do it as a rich text file. Um, and then here's my summary of those highlights. Um, and this is actually summarized. I have a bunch of other highlights in there, but this is a summary of all the things, just the things I've highlighted. This is a link to the document itself, yep. right? Um, this is, uh, you know, and then this is a link to all of the, the individual pages where I highlighted sentences. So I think if you, you know, click on page 26 there, it'll open it up in the document and bring you right to that highlight. Um, and, and just being able to summarize those highlights is, um, you know, is, is hugely useful. Yeah, and I've, you know, it's something that I didn't didn't know was even in the realm of possibility until uh, until recently, and it's just so so helpful to uh, to be able to do that. And it's um, yeah, and then to ha you know have that in addition to the uh, you know the links to the individual pages. So yeah. um, I think you know what I'm starting to do with these is to you know to kind of make this my starting point for my notes files with all of the uh, you know with all of these individual highlights. And then, you know, my notes on the document itself, um, mm -hmm. you know, I, I can start to Mine add to too. that and yeah. adding context to yeah. it and, you know, pointing to different things on different pages, but being able to separate what is my notes versus what yes. is things that I highlighted from the text um, is, is really helpful and to have it done, you know, more or less automatically is great. Um, and then again, you know, this article references, um, you know, this article references a man named, um, well, they call him Nat Bowman. I now know his name is Nathaniel Bowman, um, but they reference him being listed in an 1811 tax document uh, on this kind of a separate list uh, as George Washington's free Negroes, um, which is fascinating to have that in a tax document a decade after they're emancipated. Um, but I can say, uh, you know, they they reference reference Bowman, Nat, uh, you know, and uh, you know. Fairfax County tax records. I think that's right. Um, yeah, and Fairfax County tax records, and you know it'll put those in. And then Devin Think is learning this whole time of okay, there's links between this document and this document and this document, um, and is trying to you know trying to make sense of those. Um, and so I think uh, let's see. Uh, yeah, well, it's bringing me to a couple of uh, the. Uh, the, the tax documents that I have, um, things like that. Um, and so it's still still a work in progress, but just being able to create those links and, and have the, the application learn about um, what yeah. I'm trying to do and what I'm trying to what I'm trying to make it understand and make myself understand uh, is is really helpful. That's great. That's great. Yeah. I mean for 
personal preference, I still like reading PDFs on the iPad with I annotate, and then I'll extract the annotations with with dot file on Zotero. Um, but there's something, and then maybe ex I'm not very good about doing this. In theory, I would like to you know export those uh, notes files and then import them into Devon thing. What's nice about doing this uh, is you're skipping a step, right? You're you're yeah. extracting the annotations within Devon think itself. It's kept the original uh, uh, highlight colors, depending on the notes, mm -hmm. which which is also in itself um, helpful. Uh, I mean, Zotero does that a little, the new version of Zotero, re, the PDF reader in the new Zotero does that um, a little bit, but for it to carry over and to still have it in Dev and Think is great. Yeah, and, and I've never been a Zotero user, um, and I will uh, publicly admit that, uh, but um, I, uh, I like reading PDFs on my iPad too, and the Devon Think iPad app is great. Um, you have to pay, it's one of these things where you have to pay for the iPad app in addition to paying for the desktop app, but the PDF reader on it is probably the best PDF reader I've ever used. Um, and it syncs straight to your Devon Think database, which when it's indexed to files on in your Dropbox, it means it's also synced to files in my Dropbox. So I can read something on my iPad, make highlight, highlights with it on my iPad, it syncs a couple seconds later and then it's synced all the way through my Dropbox. And when I'm ready to go back in and actually ex extract all those highlights and make them into this note file, it's ready for me to do that on, on the, on my Mac, well, uh, which is pretty, pretty awesome. I talk a lot uh, in this series about the path dependency of research processes uh, and workflows. And I think you may have just broken path dependency. I'm going to have to look into the iPad, iPad version of yeah. Devon Think and, and try this out. Yeah, and, and you know, obviously it's it's limited in some ways. You know, it's not. I mean, this is a, a very powerful program, um, and the iPad doesn't do all of it. But the fact that I can uh, can read the PDFs on there and bring the notes in, and again have this, um, you know, it, maybe it's not perfect, but so far I've found very little that it can't do, um, or that you know really takes a bunch of extra steps to do, and it's all within one ecosystem, and it just feels like it makes life really much simpler than trying to remember, you know, was this in, was this in Evernote or was this a Word file or was yes. this in my Google Drive or was, you know, everything is here and uh, making changes one place changes it everywhere, right. um, which is also somewhat dangerous uh, if, you know, you think you're moving something to the trash and you realize that you, you know, are moving a folder and you didn't want to, um, then you have to find it later on. Um, so I think that's one word of warning is like I have uh, have done that as I was just creating the structure of like, where did I put that thing? Um, and I, you know, moved it or deleted it by accident and it's all of a sudden I can't find it. Uh, but haven't done that with actual uh, content, uh, thankfully, as I was as I was learning it. But yeah, having everything within a single ecosystem is yeah. uh, just a makes things feel easier and makes them, uh, you know, makes me makes me feel more organized uh, because when you're doing I mean, when you're doing any project, things can get disorganized really quickly. But I feel like, especially when I'm doing a project like this, where I don't know who I'm going to find where, and I don't know what, you know, where these different uh, sources are going to lead me, uh, I feel like it can, you know, can go off the rails really quickly. And so having the, these tagging functions and these linking functions and having everything live in the, in the Dev and Think ecosystem has been really useful for me. That's, that's really great. Um, is there anything else you'd like to show us with the program? Um, not, not really. I think, you know, adding that, um, you know, adding the primary source stuff is, or adding the secondary sources in there was really what kind of, uh, sealed the deal for me of like, I'm going to use this for this, is what I'm going to use for this project because this is perfect. Um, and so that was, you know, the one that I hadn't even anticipated and was really excited to find. Um, and again, with the iPad app was, was really excited to find because I, even just finding a, a good, uh, you know, like I annotate is okay, and um, but the Devon Think PDF reader is is great. Uh, I re you know it does all the things that I wanted to do, which is awesome. Uh, and uh, but that's pretty much how I how I've been using it. And now that I've been in this platform, I've started finding other uses for it, um, other kind of knowledge management things that I realized that I. You know, realizing that what I'm doing is requires some kind of knowledge management solution. Um, and so I've started using it in, uh, in my 
day job in my actual work um, that it also involves um, you know a lot of reading and note taking um, and and PDF reading and things like that um, and so I definitely didn't anticipate that I would uh, that it would extend there but it has and that's been, been kind of cool too cool cool well thank you so much for this rundown I mean this has been so informative um, and I, it's taking everything I have to like not just log off uh, this call and, and start messing around with my own dev and think um, to, to begin to link files. Um, so thanks again. And, and, you know, hopefully we can check back in uh, a couple of years from now as, as you're made progress on the book and, and hear how, hear how this has gone, new features you found, new pitfalls. Um, really, really appreciate your sharing. Yeah, I, was, I had a good time showing you all. Like I said, I've just sort of been, been making it up as I go along, but it's been a really useful platform for me. Um, you know, not not a cheap one, but uh, has been worth worth the investment for for all of the added uh, you know productivity and, and organization it's been able to offer the project. Great. All right. Well, thanks again, John. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you for watching this episode of Research Craft. If you have additional tips on how to use DevonThink, please reach out. I'd love to hear them. I'm at RA Carl on Twitter. Please subscribe to my channel and check out other videos in this series as well.